All right, so I hope the workshops were informational for you, uh, but more than that, I hope that they helped you kind of figure out what a potential next step could be for you uh, as it comes to serving the city, as it comes to being a sender, whatever that might look like for you. I hope that provided some clarity. Uh, I just want to quickly highlight two more things. I'm going to highlight them again uh, when we close out. But on the very first page of your Live Sent booklet, uh, you see there are actually two classes uh, that we are promoting. One is the Live Sent Evangelism class. So we're talking all about what it means to live sent, how to have a heart for people. Uh, but how do you actually do this within your workplace, where you live, where you play? How do you actually live this out? How do you actually get to a point of having gospel conversations with people? That's what that class is all about, the Live Sent Evangelism class. And then there's another class there called the Journey class. Uh, you kind of heard him talk about perspectives, uh, Laura and Brady Moe's video. Uh, Journey is just a six-week class about God's heart for the nations. Uh, see how that's biblically uh, accurate and solid and how that actually pushes us into uh, living sin. And so those are two classes you can sign up for. They're coming uh, up in the spring. Uh, I just want to encourage you, if you've already taken a uh, perspectives class or you've taken something like that for God so loved the world, whatever it might be, I want to encourage you to bring someone to the journey class. So rather than just uh, saying, oh, I've already taken it, that's not for me, uh, think about a handful of people in your life uh, that needs to hear this, and you can actually bring them. Uh, say, join me in this class. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight those two classes. Those are things we're providing to help equip you um, as you are living sent. Uh, all that being said, we're about to transition. Andrew Bates is going to come up. He's going to talk about having a heart for people. So let's give it up for him. Cool. <clears throat> all right, I have 16 minutes, um, and I can't even say my name in 16 minutes, so y'all just listen really fast. I'm going to try to cut off every intro, everything I have. Just imagine I just told a funny story. You're drawn in, and we're ready to go. Um, but a heart for people, I just want to start off with God showed us he will do whatever it takes to bring people in. God shows that he loves people so much he will do whatever whatever it takes, which means we should be willing to do the same as well. We see this in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Whenever we begin to think, what does it actually take to reach people? The cost shouldn't matter. We should be willing to pay it because Christ gave everything um, through love so that he might bring people to him. And we see this in his mission, what he came to do in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. It says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He came to seek and save the lost. So he did his job by coming to earth, God in a bod, living a perfect life, dying on the cross for our sin, and defeating death, defeating sin, and giving us new life through the resurrection. But he has now invited us to be a part of his process. And we, have, we can't have a live sent conference without reading one of the great commissions out of Matthew chapter 28. So I want to go to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And we see that he is actually not just calling us, but like Steve said, commanding us to go and be a part of his mission. It says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So what does Jesus tell us to do? The way I'm going to build my church, the way I'm going to reach people, the way that my crucifixion and my resurrection is actually going to matter is you. We are God's plan to reach people. We are God's plan to take the message, to take what Jesus did, and take it to the world. The only thing that matters is making disciples by reaching people for Jesus. It doesn't matter how awesome our college ministry is, which our college ministry is absolutely awesome. Um, the fact that y'all were willing to wake up and come this morning and listen to people like me and Steve and Kevin, which is, that's just awesome, so thank y'all. No matter how great our next-gen ministry is with our kids' ministry and our youth ministry, even though we hire babies to lead them, that's okay. No matter how great they are, none of that matters. I would say how great our Next Steps ministry is, but that would be saying good things about Dave. So no matter how good it could be, no matter how good all of our stuff is, no matter how life-changing sermons are, obviously when Kevin preaches, not me, no matter how great those might be, none of that matters if we're not actually reaching people and making disciples. And the only way we're going to actually reach people is if we truly have a heart for people, if we actually truly love people. Until we deeply love people the way that Christ deeply loved us, 
none of this is going to happen. Look what Jesus said in, in John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. Now the disciples are like, Jesus, that's not new. And I think Jesus would say, well, I'm not through. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. As I have loved you as deeply as I've loved you, as sacrificially as I've loved you, you should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So what is Jesus saying here? The primary marker of a follower of Jesus is this. It's one word. It's love. The primary marker of a follower of Jesus is love. So I kind of want to ask a personal question of you this morning. If I was to poll your friends and those closest to you, what one word would they use to describe you? Would they say that, man, love, without a doubt, love? Well, maybe I'm going to take a step further. What if I asked the non-believers in your life, people who don't follow Jesus, would they describe you as love? Or maybe even a deeper question, are there non-believers in your life that you are actually able to love? If we don't have love, one, we're not going to reach people for Jesus, but then really nothing else matters. The way John says this in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 was really convicting to me. He says, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Well, what, what John is saying is this, if you claim to love God but then don't love other people, you are a liar. Really, the biggest gauge in our love for God is how we love those who we love the least. Our least amount of love for someone is our capacity in order to be able to love God. So you think about how much do you love your ex-spouse? <laughs> Some of your teachers who are just absolutely annoying, how deeply do you love them? The kid that stole your money in second grade, I'm still a little bitter about that. How deeply do you love them? Karen at the HOA, how deeply do you love her? The political <laughs> pundits, the jerk at work, all those different people. The depth of love you have for them, John is saying, is the depth of love you have for God. And if we're truly going to honor the Lord, if we're truly going to reach people, we have to love them deeply. So what, what, does that, what does that look like? Well, that gets to our passage today. If you've got a Bible, you can pull out Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, we'll start in verse 22. Um, originally, I was going to dive into Mark chapter 2, and it talks about the friends bringing their friend to Jesus and tearing down the roof and all that kind of good stuff. But we're playing the Razorbacks in T-minus 30 minutes, so we're going to talk about demon-possessed pigs today. So be, I, thought that would be, I thought that would be a little bit of fun. And it just so happens to be a perfect, a perfect picture of, of what... Jesus calls us to in order to love. So Luke chapter 8, verse 22. It says, One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. This is where I would tell you all about Jesus' ministry, his home base in Capernaum, all that kind of stuff. But he says, you know what? We're going to cross the other side of the lake. And in today's terms, the other side of the tracks. We are going to a place where none of his disciples would actually want to go. And we see this in verse 26. So as they sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, or the Gadarenes, depending on your translation, which is across the lake from Galilee. So I'm going to put a picture up just to kind of let you see. Jesus and his guys would be in Capernaum up at the very top, and they would sail all the way down to the bottom to the land of Gadara, the land of the Gadarenes, the land of the Gerasenes, about a 10-mile boat ride. But there was something special about the, the land of the Gerasenes. This is where people were actually pig farmers. They would raise pigs because this is where people would dump all their trash and the pigs would eat the trash. It was an absolutely disgusting place. But it's just disgusting not just because of the setting, but because these guys are Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. His disciples are Jewish. Jews and pigs don't go together. I'm so thankful I am not Jewish because I love bacon. Like That just seems really sad to me. But this is an absolutely disgusting place. This is about as messy as it can get with garbage and trash and pigs, the other side of the tracks. And Jesus says, we need to go there. That's where we need to be. So his disciples are out of their comfort zone. And they're they are across the tracks. They have no idea where the Chick-fil-A's are. They don't know what is happening in the here and now. But Jesus says, we need to go for a purpose. Look at verse 27. It says, when Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. The mess just got 
messier. Can you imagine going to the land of pigs, the land of trash, and all of a sudden a naked man possessed with demons who's been living in a tomb shows up at the feet of Jesus. That's about as messy as it gets. That shows us something incredibly important about Jesus and what his love looks like. Jesus went to the mess. Jesus went to the mess. He didn't wait for the guy to become undemon possessed. He didn't wait for the guy to take a shower. He didn't wait for the guy to put clothes on, even though he probably asked him to later on. He didn't, he didn't wait for this guy to get it all together. Guys, Jesus loves us just as we are. Now, he loves us too much to leave us there, but he loves us just as we are. So if Jesus doesn't expect people to get their life together to come to him, why do we? Why do we? Why does our love have this little asterisk on it? Once you get it together, once you stop doing those things, then I will love you. We see Jesus love this guy no matter what was happening in his life. Which means the people in our life that feel like enemies, the people that feel like they're, they're the biggest messes, maybe they're the ones that we need to go to first. But I want you to notice, Jesus didn't just wait for him to get cleaned up. Jesus didn't wait for the guy to come to him. Jesus, in turn, went to him, which makes me think, are we maybe getting this whole thing called church wrong? We're wanting to reach people, we're wanting to bring them to Jesus, but we're expecting them to first come to us. Are we getting the location of our sharing of Jesus wrong? Now, don't get me wrong, I love the location of this building on the campus of LSU. Kevin talked about that last week. I love where our Segan location is. I hope we never move there because it's a great spot for me to shoot my bow in the morning. Like, I absolutely love our locations there. But are we expecting people to come to us instead of us going to them? Are we willing to pack up and move and go where people are at instead of waiting for them to come to us? Jesus never said, build it, plan it, execute it, celebrate it, they'll come. He says, no, follow me as I go where the people actually are. A few years ago, the last church I served at, um, someone gave me a book. I thought it was a joke at first because the title of it was How to Pick Up a Stripper. And I, and I read it at first and I was like, whoa, this is very forward. And then the subtitle is And Other Acts of Kindness, written by a pastor on actually how they started a ministry to strippers in the Nashville area. And the Lord really began to put a burden on my heart of, Lord, I think you're calling us to do something about this because uh, we were at Leesville near Fort Polk a lot of army guys there and strip clubs were just a really big deal around army bases so the Lord relayed on our heart to let's go minister to the strippers now Gary before I get fired over here I do want to say I never stepped into the strip clubs our ladies would actually go in and I would sit out in the parking lot which is really awkward as I'm sitting there in my truck at a strip club as people come by hey what are you doing here what are you doing here like it's kind of it was just it was it was really really awkward and we got some pushback as you can imagine on that but what happened was those ladies saw how deeply my wife and a couple other ladies loved them by showing up and saying I love you just as you are I love you just as you are and we'll I'll talk more about it in a minute none of those ladies ever came to Christ while we were there but they knew they were loved and they knew they had a place to come and one of the bouncers Scott that I actually got to know you know on the outside of the strip club he actually came to one of our Easter services the last year before we left. We have to go to the mess because the mess is where Jesus can save. Let's keep going. So Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. What we see is Jesus didn't just go to the guy. He didn't just go to the mess. Jesus made it personal. Jesus made it personal. Now, whether he was actually asking the guy his name or if he was talking to the demons, it doesn't matter. He went to the guy. He engaged with him. He took time to engage with the person who desperately needed him. How often do we actually take time in our world to make it personal? Much less with people who are messy. We're always busy. We always got somewhere to go. Even on Sunday mornings, I find myself bouncing around between people, just waving and smiling, thinking, I got stuff I got to do. And finally realizing, Lord, the people are the stuff we got to do. People are what matter most. So I want to ask you, do you take time in your everyday life to make it personal, specifically to the people in the mess? How many of, you, how many of your neighbors do you actually know by name? And I'm the pot calling the kettle black there because I'm not great doing that, but my wife is un 
unbelievable. Now, one, she has two things going for her, three things. She's really cute, which helps. Um, she's got a big, fat golden retriever. She's always walking, and we have a two-year-old. So we have, like, this automatic connection with people, like, oh, we want to talk to them. They're safe people. And I'm like, if only you do. Um, but my wife, she's great knowing people's names. And she knows Julie. She knows Daryl. She knows Jackie. She knows Bob. She knows Shirley. She knows Gia, I think the way you say her name, and Emu, and Imu, and Brooke, and Monica. She knows all these people in our neighborhood. We've had gospel conversations with some. But then some she hasn't yet because she's just building that relationship and turn to build trust. But how is she doing that? She's making it personal. She's taking time to slow life down and actually engage with people face to face. I don't want to use the young girl's name, but we had a, a young girl show up at our Seekin location this past Sunday. Um, and Andy and Kendra Ferris, one of our elders, they were out working the New Year Start Here tent. And I immediately heard the girl when she walked in saying, yeah, I just want to let you know I'm not religious and if y'all were here Sunday, the title of the message was Submission in Marriage. So I was like, oh boy, you picked a great day to come if you're not religious. Until I actually heard her story, and it turned out to be the perfect Sunday for her to be there. But I found out more about her, not just that she came because she felt like she needed to. For the past four years, people have been making it personal with her at Lighthouse. She knew Steve's face whenever he came up to talk to her after Guys, we have no idea what hangs in the balance of slowing down and making it personal. Make it personal. Let's keep going. It says, a large herd of pigs, Arkansas Razorbacks, were feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. Now, there might not be a lake at Razorback Stadium today, but there was snow, so maybe the pigs are going to drown in snow. I'm not sure, but the reason why I brought this up is this shows us something incredibly important. Jesus didn't just make it personal. He didn't just enter into the mess. Jesus saved the man. Jesus saved the man in this story. He rescued him from evil. He rescued him from death. He rescued him from his own sin. Now, I want to bring this up for, for two reasons. One, for us to see the beautiful nature of of salvation, that Jesus was willing to go and engage the man in his mess, that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, he was all-powerful, he could say, come out of this man, and he invite him in to life. But two, I want us to see this, because guys, salvation is Jesus' job, not ours. Salvation is 100% of God. When it comes to us sharing the gospel with people, fruit is not our responsibility, faithfulness to the task is our responsibility like i mentioned earlier none of the ladies that we're ministering to in the strip clubs came to know christ while we were there that wasn't our job salvation is the lord's work it was our job to love them and to engage with them it's not our job to make people fall in love with jesus but it is our job to help set up the date for them to be able to encounter him salvation is completely of the lord now if you like Abram kind of mentioned, if you want more information about that, we have an awesome four-hour class. It's only one hour at a time. Starting January 22nd, we'll have four sessions at LSU, and then we'll flip it over to Segan. And I'm, I'm saying it's awesome not because I was a part of the team that put it together. All I did was sit there and smile because Abram and Andrew Riley crushed it. But this is an awesome opportunity to see what does it look like to actually live sent. What does it look like to make it personal? What does it look like to merge universes? What does it look like to speak the language of people that you are trying to reach? But still remembering that salvation is the Lord's work, not ours. All right, last, last part of the passage. It says, The man from whom the demons had gone out begged him to go with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. So Jesus entered the mess, Jesus made it personal, Jesus saved the man, and then what did Jesus do? Jesus sent the man. Jesus sent the man. I want you to notice, this, this guy had been a Christian for about 30 seconds. Hopefully he put some clothes on before he went back to preach, right? Uh, he was immediately, Jesus said, you know what? go. Now, I get what this guy wants to say. He wanted to stay with Jesus. If I'd just been, man, possessed by demons and Jesus rescued me, I'm like, I'm sticking with this dude forever. But Jesus says, no, your job's not to stay with me. Your job is to be sent, to go, to tell the people you have influence with about me. So if you've ever wondered, am I actually called to be sent? I love the way David Platt put it, like Steve said, get mad at him, not at us. We're not called, we're commanded. If you ever wonder if you're qualified, 
This guy was demon-possessed and naked 30 seconds before he started to preach the gospel. We're doing okay. Okay? And I had, I had fun with this when I was at LSU a few weeks ago talking about Disciple Maker. Um, if you love Jesus, there's a couple qualifications to be sent. You have to love Jesus. You have to be following him. And you take your two fingers here and you press right there. If it is moving, you're called and you're qualified to share Jesus. If it's not moving, please let someone know. But the reality is, once we come to know Christ, we have everything we need to lead other people to him. And it starts with love. It starts with love. Because we're not going to be willing to sacrifice what we have to if we don't deeply love people. And ultimately, we're not going to love God the way he calls us to if we don't deeply love people. But let's, let's be honest. One, loving people is very difficult. And if we did this extremely well, if this was the norm, our world would not be in the case that it is right now. We wouldn't have all the chaos that we have. So what, so what are some obstacles before us? Um, and Kevin, I did this for you. We have three obstacles, and they're all C's. So I did that, did that just for you. So you're welcome. So obstacles, the first obstacle is this. It's complacency. Complacency gets in our way. We're comfortable with where we are. We're comfortable with our life. We're comfortable with our walk with Jesus. We think everything is hunky dory, and that would disrupt our everyday life. If we actually began to live sent, if we actually began to sacrifice, if we actually began to love people. The passage I was going to teach on in Mark chapter 2 with the friends bringing their friend to, to Jesus. In that story, there are also three C's there's the crippled guy. They're the friends that are the carriers, and then there's the crowd. And what you notice about the crowd is, yes, they're there to hear something from Jesus, but their complacency actually got in the way of other people coming to Christ. So our complacency doesn't just keep us out of the mission of Jesus. It actually gets in the way of other people coming to Jesus. Complacency. The next one's this, conflict. Conflict. Jesus, following Jesus really is a license to be misunderstood. Because if we're going to truly love people the way Jesus loved us, it is going to be countercultural to this world, and it will not make sense. Uh, you can't even imagine the first conversation I had with our deacon board at my last church when I said, hey, I want to start a ministry to strippers. Like, that was a license to be misunderstood. If we're truly going to love to that level, we are going to be, be mis misunderstood. Guys, Jesus loved perfectly, and they still killed him for it. We're going to face conflict. We're going to face struggles. We're going to have people that just don't get it. We have to be willing to take that step and move past. And last one's this, cost. It kind of funnels all of this together. Yes, it, it cost Jesus time to go see the man. It cost Jesus the boat ride over there. But also cost him his reputation. It also put him in danger because those pigs that he sent off into the lake, they belong to somebody. And those people actually ran him out of town. He just saved this guy, but due to the cost, they actually ran Jesus out of town. We see that in verse 34 and verse 37. But ultimately, what did it cost Christ? It cost Christ everything. It cost him everything in order to love in the way that it took to bring us back to God. So loving people, it ain't easy. Loving your spouse isn't easy, much less people who are a lot different than you. People who are messy. It's going to cost you time-wise, financially, resource, reputation, comfort. It will cost you. But when we look at our Savior, it cost him everything. He gladly gave it up. Why? Because of his deep love for us. So I want to ask you, are you ready to love? Are you ready to love? Are you ready to answer the question, what does love require of me? Because if we're going to fulfill this 10-year vision, and we're going to send people all around the globe, it starts right here. Am I willing to love the people that God has put me with? I'm going to ask you to, to bow your head this morning. One, just because I want to pray over everyone and also give the band time to make their way up. But I really want to pray. Because love is costly, and love really takes everything we have. But if we're truly going to be involved in the mission of God, we have to be willing to give, to give it all. So, Lord Jesus, I just pray. God, I pray over this weekend. Um, Lord, what a sweet time yesterday. Just locations coming together, college ministry coming together. All of us just singing praises to your name. Got beautiful challenges from both Kevin and from Steve. I mean, the prayer time with Abram, Lord. All of that was absolutely beautiful. But ultimately, God, this conference means nothing if we're not individually ready to love you and individually ready to love those around us. 
So, Father, I pray that you would open our eyes to see the people who need love, but, God, open our hearts to give us courage to love those no matter the cost, to love those no matter what's going to come against us, no matter the conflict we're going to face. God, I pray that we would look and see how deeply broken we were, how big of a mess we were before you came in and saved us, just like you saved the man in Luke chapter 8. And we would take that love that you had for us and reciprocate it back out to the world. So, Father, I pray as we begin get ready to end this conference, Lord, that this wouldn't be somewhere that we just come and get excited, where we just come and get information. Lord, it's a time of transformation to where we look to you and see the deep love you have for us and allow it to truly transform us, to be your hands, to be your feet, to be your face of love in this world. Father, we love you so much. In the name of Jesus, we pray.